The runic system of writing has been in use by Germanic peoples at least since the 2nd century AD, and by the 4th century people have begun carving them into stone monuments. The word rune originally meant something like secret or mystery, and it is said that the signs were first revealed to Odin after having hung himself in the world tree of Yggdrasil for nine long nights. Considering this, and the fact that they are often decorated with strange mythical beings, one would be forgiven for thinking that the runestones speak of some mythological tales or riddles. In fact, the vast majority of them were raised as memorials to the dead, and what they say is fairly standardized and mundane. They record who raised them, whom they are for, and how or where that person died. Finally, they tend to end with something like, may God help his spirits, and are often decorated with crosses. This is because their heyday corresponds to the 11th century, a time when Scandinavia had to a large extent been Christianized. But there are some stones that break the mold, and either live up to their mysterious reputation, or reveal some interesting clues about history. And that's what we're going to be looking at in this video. In 1917, a farmer in the municipality of Sognendal in western Norway stumbled upon an Iron Age tomb while ploughing one of his fields. It was the final resting place of one man, and had been roofed over by a large flat slab of stone measuring about 160 by 70 centimeters. On the side facing the deceased was found the by far longest known inscription in Elder Futhark, the first version of the runes. The slab has since become known as the Egya Stone, named after the farm where it was discovered. It's dated to around 650 to 700 AD, and was in other words made about a century before the beginning of the Viking Age. Considering that the runes were found facing downwards, they were never actually meant to be read, and were probably a form of protective magic over the grave. The inscription is also believed to have been written in stylized poetry, but opinions diverge over what exactly it says. Nonetheless, here is one attempted translation. It is not touched by the sun, and the stone is not scored by an iron knife. No man may lay it bare when the waning moon runs across the heavens. Misguided men may not lay the stone aside. The man sprinkled the stone with corpse sea, with it he rubbed the tholes of the well-drilled boat. As who came the army god hither unto the land of warriors? a fish swimming out of a terrible stream, a bird screaming into the enemy band. Protection against the wrongdoer. The second part of the text seems to describe a sacrifice to facilitate the passage of the deceased, or to call on whatever power the inscription is addressed to. The so-called corpse sea that the stone has been stained with is a poetic name for blood, and the god of armies may refer to Odin, who comes to the land of the living to take the deceased to an afterlife. A small forest in southern Sweden is the site of another stone made at roughly the same period in time. Known as the Björketorp runestone, it stands at a height of 4.2 meters, and is one of the tallest runestones ever made. Together with two uninscribed neighbors, it forms a circular monument, and like the Egya stone in Norway, it contains a magical inscription. Or, to be more precise, this stone is cursed. It reads something like this. I, master of the runes, conceal here runes of power. Incessantly plagued by maleficence, doomed to insidious death is he who breaks this monument. I prophesy destruction. Scholars are not in agreement on the purpose of this runestone. It was originally suggested that it might be a grave and that the curse is intended to protect it, but subsequent excavations have not revealed any finds in or around the stone circle. It could therefore be a cenotaph, in other words, a memorial that's separate from the actual burial, or perhaps it was a shrine for some deity. It's also speculated that the monument could have served as a border between the Swedes and Danes. The fate of many runestones has been to be used as building material for churches, and this was also the case with the famous Rök runestone. In the 17th century, it was discovered inside the walls of a church in Östergötland, Sweden, and it was only in the mid-19th century that it was finally removed and raised in a nearby cemetery. It was then discovered that the stone had carvings on all sides except for its base, and these inscriptions have puzzled researchers ever since. 
With around 760 characters, this is the longest known pre-Christian runic inscription, and judging from its language and use of younger Futhark, the runestone has been dated to the early 9th century. It was made by a man called Varin, and seems to have been composed in an intentionally cryptic way, perhaps to demonstrate the author's great knowledge of runes, poetry, and myths. Parts of the inscription are made with elder Futhark, and others are concealed by the use of cipher runes. Varin also makes frequent use of kennings, a sort of figure of speech, like the term corpse sea used on the Egya stone, and also seems to make reference to parts of Norse mythology that are now completely forgotten. Not surprisingly, there are countless different interpretations of the texts, but the traditional view is that it retells the heroic deeds of past kings, along with aspects of mythology. A notable example of this is the passage generally thought to mention Theodoric the Great, who ruled the Ostrogothic Kingdom of Italy until his death in 526. Quote, I say this second, who nine generations ago lost his life for the Ravegoths and died with them for his guilt. Theodoric the Bold, chief of sea warriors, ruled over the shores of the Raid Sea. Now he sits armed on his Gothic horse, his shield strapped, the prince of the Marings. But why exactly did Varin take the time and effort to have this stone carved? Well, the inscription begins with him dedicating it in memory of his dead son, Vemoder. This has led some to think that it was carved to preserve tribal myths, as Varin was no longer able to pass them on to his son. Others have thought that it was carved to raise his tribe to vengeance over Vemoder's death, or that Varin was a tribal leader and made it to strengthen his position. Most recently, it has been speculated that it deals with fears of a new climate crisis. In this view, the text isn't concerned with heroic deeds in war, but deals through riddles with the conflict between light and darkness, or warmth and cold. Scandinavia had been hit with a series of exceedingly harsh winters nine generations before the stone was made, and in the late 8th and early 9th centuries, the climate once again got colder, accompanied by unusual phenomena like strong solar storms and an almost complete solar eclipse. It wouldn't be surprising then if it seemed to Varin and his contemporaries as if the mythical Fimble winter, which precedes Ragnarok, was near. However, as it stands, how to read and interpret the stone is still up for debate, and it may well never be completely understood. With the beginning of the Viking Age, more and more runestones start to tell of travels to foreign lands, like England, Greece, or the Middle East. In some cases, the Vikings even left behind runic inscriptions where they went, and that is the case with the Piraeus Lion. This ancient Greek sculpture was originally made in the 4th century BC, and was during Roman times placed in Piraeus, the port of Athens. Over time, it grew to become a prominent symbol of the city, but was eventually looted and taken to Venice in 1687. This is where its runic inscriptions were finally discovered by a Swedish diplomat in the 18th century. Of course, the symbols had been noticed before, but nobody quite knew what kind of writing it was, or how to interpret them. Made in the shape of lindworms, a kind of mythical dragon or serpent, the text is divided into two portions. These were most likely made on separate occasions in the 11th century by Swedish mercenaries serving the Byzantine Emperor. Unfortunately, erosion has made it very difficult to read the text, and attempts to translate it have yielded widely different results. Nonetheless, this translation from 1914 is generally considered the most accurate. They cut him down in the midst of his forces. But in the harbour, the men cut runes by the sea in memory of Horsi, a good warrior. The Swedes set this on the lion. He went his way with good counsel, gold he won in his travels. The warriors cut runes, hewed them in an ornamental scroll. Askil and Thorleifer had them well cut, they who lived in Roslagen. After this, we're missing a few names, but it says that a certain person, son of so-and-so, cut these runes. Then it continues, Alfer and another person color them in memory of Horsi. He won gold in his travels. The early Middle Ages saw a steep decline in the number of new runestones. By the end of the 12th century, they had more or less stopped being made, and by the 14th century, the runes themselves had fallen out of use in most of Scandinavia. But there were some places where they lingered on for much longer, like the wealthy island of Gotland in the Baltic Sea. 
Here, runic grave monuments continue to be made well into the Middle Ages, although no longer decorated with lindworms, but in a more continental fashion. A good example that demonstrates just how long the runes remained in use here is this tombstone in the floor of the church in Lie. Housewife Rodve had this stone made over her husbandman, Jakober in Mannagarder, who was shot to pieces by a gunstone at Visboy when King Eiriker was stationed at the aforementioned castle. And then, 1400 years and one year less than 50 years had passed since God's birth. Let us pray that God be gracious to his soul and to all Christian souls. Amen. In other words, Jacob had been shot to death by a cannon, not exactly something you'd expect to read on a runestone. The year of his death was 1449, and the mentioned king was Eric of Pomerania. Originally, he had been ruler of the Kalmar Union, comprising all the kingdoms of Scandinavia, but by this time he had been deposed and had fled to the island of Gotland. Here he ruled from the main city of Visby, where he directed the strong fortress of Visboi, and made a living by conducting piracy against the Hanseatic League and the Teutonic Order. In 1449, however, Visby was besieged, and Eric was finally forced to leave the island for his home of Pomerania. <laughs> 